Good morning, church. It's great to see you all. My name is Jason. I'm excited to worship with you this morning. Uh, as we enter into worship, would you guys stand with me? I'm going to pray for us before we sing this morning. Heavenly Father, we just come before you, and I'm just humbled to be in your presence. God, I thank you that you are here. God, I thank you that uh, we can worship you this morning and just think about the sacrifice that you made for us on the cross. God, as we march on towards Good Friday and Easter and um, this Passion Week, God, I pray that you would just be with us as we go about our daily activities. Help us to just stop and be able to remember what you've done for us as we go through our day, that we would just be reminded of the sacrifice you made. God, I thank you that we can worship you this morning. We give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together, church.
shed on the cross for us, that our sins are washed away, and the bridge has been formed between us and you. God, I thank you that our sins can be forgiven if we just ask, if we ask and we receive and believe 
that you are the savior of this world, that you gave your life on Calvary and died our death on a cross just so that we can come and live with you someday. Each one of us, Father, I know is loved beyond anything that we could possibly imagine. I pray, God, that we would realize that this morning if we don't already know you. God, if there's anyone here that just needs to receive that free gift of salvation, that they would look to you, that they would ask some more questions, that they would talk to whoever it is that they need to talk to or just simply fall to their knees and cry out for you to save them. We thank you for who you are, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jay. All right. Good morning, church. Um, my name is Daniel. If you are new here, uh, you may not know me. If you've only been a few weeks, maybe you're used to seeing Mike up here. So I'm Daniel. I'm one of the pastors. I am uh, excited to just bring the message this morning. If um, if you are new here and you hate this morning, good news. Mike will be back next week and all will be made right. Uh, if you love this morning, then, you know, Mike and I are very similar in the way we teach, so it's just consistent and, and all is good, right? Either way, it's good. So, um, first of all, let me just say, like, I was back there in the hall, and because I don't preach very often, um, I don't remember what the, there's a lock on that door, a code, and I never remember what it is. And I'm sitting back there like, okay, 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 I'm going to remember it. And I'm like, I'm going to get walked out and then I'm going to look like an idiot, but it's all right. Made it. We're all good. I was back there in the hallway just praying, right? Um, anytime, I think, as we prepare to speak, you know, the prayer is, um, I don't want y'all to hear me. I want you to hear the Holy Spirit. Whether you are uh, spoken to by the Holy Spirit about what we talked about this morning or if he is just hitting you with something completely different, that's all I want for you this morning. But as I'm back there praying, I can hear y'all singing, I plead the blood, I plead the blood. And what a beautiful um, just moment that was to, to hear your voices lifting up, I plead the blood. This Friday, we are gonna be doing a, a Good Friday service. We're actually gonna do it across the street in our kids' campus. And you may be wondering, why are we doing our service over there? It is not a normal service. And what I mean by that is it's just a different flow, a different format. We, we're stripping things down, we're going unplugged, we're rearranging chairs. It, it looks, it feels different. It's not a normal church service. But uh, I would highly encourage you, we're doing that at 7 p.m. this Friday for good service. And here's the thing, as we approach Easter Sunday, what we want to do is we wanna prepare our hearts, right? That's what Holy Week is about. The rhythm of Holy Week is really to prepare us for what's to come because the reality is we can't really, really grab hold of the resurrection if we first don't go to the cross, right? And so Friday night is about us going to the cross. We're gonna to go to the cross and and we are going to plead the blood because we know what happens on Sunday. So I would invite you, show up across the street. We're not going to have um, child care for kids, but kids are welcome. We want you as a family uh, worshiping with us and, and learning with us. So make sure uh, you have that on your calendar if you don't already. On Sunday, we have kind of a big, important holiday for the church um, kind of a big deal. It is Resurrection Sunday. Next Sunday is Easter. We are going to have three services. We have an 8 a.m., a 9.30, and 11. I want to reiterate what Mike said. It's the shortest mission trip you can ever take. If you are regular here, especially if you show up for this 9.30 service, it's going to be packed. If you show up normally for the 11 service, it's going to be packed. So if you are able and you are not trying to drag teenagers out of bed, show up for that early service, right? It'll, it'll uh, mean a lot to the to guests that we have coming. It'll mean a lot to us to make room for them. And, uh, and it's going to be identical services, all three services. We have baptism, all three services. So there's a QR code. You can hold up your phone to that QR code. It will bring up a little thing. You click it, and you could go right into telling us that you are interested in getting baptized. If there is any, any part of you that feels like God has been nudging you, 
that this is a step of obedience. This is the next step of your faith journey that you need to take. I would highly encourage you, go ahead and click on that. Talk to us. Let us know. Okay? Even if you decide this one isn't the time, let's at least have a conversation about it and see what God may be calling you to do. All right? Then the following Sunday, which is April 7th, I believe, uh, the following Sunday, we have a special guest, Master Teague the Third, who is an Ohio State running back coming. Mike is going to interview him. This is so much fun for me. Like the normal football season of watching y'all just tear each other apart and hate on each other. As someone who didn't come from the Midwest could care less about which Big Ten football team does well. This is, I get such pleasure and enjoyment out of watching y'all just hate on each other so much. But in uh, just the, um, you know, message of the gospel and peace and unity within the church, Mike and Master Teague are going to sit down and um, really be able to just talk through what it looks like for Master Teague through his life, share his testimony and what it looks like for him to communicate the gospel, which is super exciting. I was telling our team, it's been really weird. Um, I'm going to tell you all this. I don't know that I'll tell him, but I've been, you know, emailing with Master Teague, just trying to get all of the details and logistics and everything worked out. And whenever you email somebody, you know, we're at that like informal phase of emailing now. So I'm like, hey, master. And then I type the email and I'm like, this feels, it feels weird to just call someone master. And I feel like I should bow. I don't know, but that's been my life. All right, so let's jump in. That's all the announcements I have. Let's uh, jump in to what we're gonna talk about today. Anybody love expectation versus reality memes? Okay, great. Well, y'all are going to hate this thing because that's what the whole morning is about is expectations versus reality. All right. Okay. I know some of y'all didn't raise your hands because it's early. Do any of you like expectations versus reality memes? Raise your hand. There we go. We have participation. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's okay. All right. You're old, but it's okay. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. All right. Let's take a look at these. I've got just a few of these for us to kind of have some fun with. Um, maybe. That's me. On the screen. There we go. All right. All right. So uh, first one we have, yeah, I don't know what happened on the attempt there. Um, that's the wrong color and all sorts of things. Let's look at the next one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, super close. Super close. You almost got there. All right. Next one. <laughs> uh, just soak that up. That's that's amazing. This is literally one of my favorite memes. I use this all the time. Um, that looks good. I like that one. Oh, Is that Stitch or Lilo? I don't know. Stitch? Poor Stitch. Yes. <laughs> That's so good. That's so good. All right. Uh, just, I wanted to show you a few of those because they're, they're fun and entertaining. I wanted to show you one... Um, so I think it was whenever Abby was five years old, we were living in Arizona. My mom flew in from Texas to visit us and be there for her birthday. And um, Summer was going to make this amazing like Disney princess cake. And I was going to show you a picture of it. But what happened was um, somewhere in the process of making it, Summer took said cake and chucked it right across the kitchen into the wall and it exploded and I remember my, my mom, my sweet mom, who'd come to visit, was sitting in the living room and doing one of these like, oh, no. And I, I was like, I'm going to go to the store and buy cake. Um, anyways, I'm sure you all have your own kind of expectation versus reality stories. Most of us do. Some of those are really funny. Some of those we can look back on and we can laugh and have a good time. Uh, some of those, they just roll right off our back, but some of those, not so much, right? So this morning, we're going to get into an expectation versus reality moment in Scripture, and, and we're just going to dig in and see what we might learn from it, okay? So we're in, um, we've been in this, this series where we've been looking at kings, right? And so we're, we're in the last week of that series, and I thought, what better way to end that series than on Palm Sunday? Palm Sunday is, uh, it marks the, the beginning of Holy Week, right? It's a time when the church reflects on the days leading up to Jesus' crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. 
It's leading up to Easter Sunday, a time of reflection and preparation. Palm Sunday marks the, the day the Jewish people celebrated the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem to observe Passover among them. And whenever you, when we open our, our Bibles, when we look at this passage of scripture this morning, you're going to see most of them are titled with a heading, the triumphal entry. So as we look at that first, let's, let's just set the stage for what's happening, okay? So Jesus has been teaching, he's been performing miracles, but no miracle up to this point has been bigger than the resurrection of Jesus' friend, Lazarus, right? If you recall that story, he shows up well after um, everyone had called on him, and Jesus calls forth Lazarus out of the tomb. So Jesus' popularity is exploding, right? People are beginning to take notice. The, the crowds are getting bigger and bigger, and people are beginning to believe that maybe, just maybe, Jesus is the promised Messiah. In fact, um, Jesus is with Lazarus at his home in Bethany, and, and he spends time with Lazarus and then leaves his home to make his way toward Jerusalem, and the, the crowds begin to gather at the city gate. When those crowds gathered, what was their expectation? What was their expectation? So they gather together, and what the crowds are looking for, what the crowds are expecting, is the triumphal entry of the King of Kings. They are waiting on Jesus to enter into Jerusalem as the conquering hero. He's going to uh, take the throne. He's going to step into the place that has been prepared for him. He's going to lead the people of Israel out of captivity. He's going to free them from outside rule and occupation of pagan empires. This is their expectation. This is the day that God had told his people would come centuries before. So they've been waiting their entire lives for this. Stories, scriptures, passed down from generation to generation, wondering when will the Messiah come? When will we have our new king? The triumphal entry fulfills their hope in God's promise of reestablishing his throne in Jerusalem. As Jesus rode in on a colt, the people recognized that God was fulfilling his promise to redeem and restore his people. And they welcomed the son of David, the one who came in the name of the Lord. So I want us to look at that text. So this is in Matthew chapter 21. We're going to look at verses 1 through 11, the triumphal entry. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethphage, on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said. As you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them, bring them to me. If anyone asks what you are doing, just say, the Lord needs them, and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble. Riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others, they cut branches from the trees around him and were shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they asked. And the crowds replied, it's Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. I want to look at um, some of the different gospel writers as we know. Whenever they record accounts that happen in history, they're, they're recording true events, actual things that happen. And like always, you have different perspectives and they highlight different details, right? So I want to look at, at part of Luke's account of this. This is found in, in Luke chapter 19. As he rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the king 
who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. And (laughs) I love this. Jesus replies, If they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. That is amazing. And I believe to be true. John records it this way. The next day, the news that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. They shouted, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it, fulfilling the prophecy that said, don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming, riding on a donkey's colt. So as Jesus enters the gates of Jerusalem that day, what did the people believe about him and what was taking place? They believed absolutely that Jesus was the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They believed absolutely that Jesus was the promised king of Israel, and they believed that Jesus was the one who fulfilled all of the prophecies. So where did those ideas and that belief come from? I want to do just some rapid fire on some prophecy that we see specifically on the kingship of the Messiah, okay? So I'm going to run through these really quick. They are going to be on the screen, um, but if you follow along in your own Bible, you might just write down the references to these because we'll go pretty quick um, because there's several of them, okay? So this is in Isaiah chapter 9. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government And its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. 2 Samuel, furthermore, the Lord declares that he will make a house for you, a dynasty of kings. For when you die and are buried with your ancestors, I will raise up one of your descendants, your own offspring, and I will make his kingdom strong. He is the one who will build a house, a temple for my name, and I will secure his royal throne forever. Jeremiah 23, for the time is coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up a righteous descendant from King David's line. He will be a king who rules with wisdom. He will do what is just and right throughout the land, and this will be his name. The Lord is our righteousness. In that day, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. Daniel 2, during the reigns of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered. It will crush all the kingdoms into nothingness, and it will stand forever. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him, his recompense before him. Zechariah 9 Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O Lord, in Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. And then Zephaniah 3, for the Lord will remove his hand of judgment and will disperse the armies of your enemy. And the Lord himself, the king of Israel, will live among you. At last your troubles will be over and you will never again fear disaster. Can you imagine what it must have been like for the people of God to hear these prophecies their entire lives? They knew them. They memorized them. They they spoke them to each other. Can you imagine as you grew up in that, wondering if maybe, just maybe, it would happen in your lifetime? And then Jesus arrives. Everything is beginning to line up. Could he be the one? As he teaches, as he heals, hope begins to turn into belief. This is the promised Messiah. The prophecies were fulfilled in every way. And it was indeed a time of rejoicing as Jerusalem welcomed their king. 
But unfortunately, their celebration was not to last. Rightfully so, the people of God had been watching, waiting, praying for this time to come. But they fell into an age-old trap, and it's the same trap that I would say we fall into over and over again. They took the promises of God, and they created their own expectations for how God would fulfill those promises. They took the promises of God, and then they made and created their own expectations for how God was going to act. And when we do that, we find ourselves in a mess. A mess that ultimately can only be described as sin. Have you ever found yourself in that situation? Where you've put expectations on God as to how he might should be doing certain things. And if so, how does that work out for you? (laughs) How do, we, how do we handle those unmet expectations whenever we believe that God has maybe failed to act the way that we thought? What happens when we apply our expectations to God's promises? We're going to look at a few different things this morning. One, what happens when we apply our expectations to God's promises? We stop trusting God and we start trusting plan B. So Old Testament, Genesis um, we, our Genesis study has been having an amazing time in, uh, this last fall and then our winter spring semester that's going on right now. It has been just truly a blessing to dive in and study the word as we have. Um, but this is one of, uh, the characters that we have been studying in Genesis, uh, this semester, um, Abram and Sarai. Okay. So if, if you remember, uh, Abram and Sarai, they get renamed Abraham and Sarah, um, Abraham is a patriarch of our faith. He's one of the forefathers of our faith. If you uh, recall so many times in the Old Testament, he's referred to as, God is referred to as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the Abram that we're talking about. Abram starts off and and God calls Abram to leave his home and go to a foreign land that God is going to show him. And God tells him he's going to bless him and his descendants. He's going to make from Abram a great nation with a mission, right? So, so God, uh, so Abram goes to this land. God reaffirms this call several times, but even after arriving to the land, even after having this, this call spoken over him, this blessing spoken, spoken over him multiple times by God, Abram decides to leave that land when he's not supposed to. And he takes his family and he goes, to another land that he's not supposed to be in. And when he's in disobedience, he ends up putting his wife, Sarai, in danger. She's a beautiful woman. He goes into this land. He knows that he might get killed because of how beautiful she is. So he lies and tells everyone that she's his sister. That's stupid. Don't do that. So uh, Sarai gets taken and Ultimately, God has to intervene. Abram makes this huge mess. He's not where he's supposed to be. He lies. He deceives. God intervenes so that God can fulfill the promise that he's given them, right? God, again, reestablishes his call on Abram. This time, he makes a covenant with him, but Abram and Sarai don't trust God's plan because of their own lack of faith and their own understanding. Let me put it this way. They have human obstacles, right? Right? At this point, they are past the childbearing age. Abram is nearly 100. Sarai is uh, 90 years old. They don't see how God can overcome their human understanding of these human obstacles. And whenever they don't believe that God is going to do what he says they're going to do in the manner in which they thought he was originally going to do it, they decide to enact plan B. It's okay, God, we got this. We'll take it upon ourselves. So what do they do? Sarah decides to give her husband, her servant, Hagar. This is how we're going to have a child. This is how God's going to fulfill his promise. If you're not familiar with the story, that doesn't end well, right? They go outside of God's plan to a plan that they come up with, and they try and basically maneuver away for God to fulfill his promise. God did not need their help. In fact, that created lots of strife 
the, the descendant that came from Hagar's line ends up being a, a nation of people at war and strife with themselves and with everyone around them. Finally, God once again reaffirms his call on Abram and Sarai. He gives them new names. He explains things more clearly. And still, they can't believe it's true. But this time, they decide to trust God rather than themselves. And God blesses them with a son, Isaac. But the audacity, right? Hey, God, we, we know you said you're going to do this, but we've actually come across some, some things that Ah, we think maybe you didn't think about, you weren't ready for, so we've come up with a plan that's probably better than yours. We're problem solvers. We got it all taken care of, right? And we understand when we put it that way that that sounds absolutely ridiculous that we would tell God the faults in his plan and correct it, but we do that, don't we? How have you abandoned God's plan for for you, his call for you, because you stopped trusting what God was doing and trusted yourself instead. What happens when we apply our own expectations to God's promises? Number two, we fight a physical battle instead of a spiritual one. We fight a physical battle instead of a spiritual one. I do not know what you are going through in your life right now. But for some of you, this is the only thing you may need to hear this morning. When we apply our expectations to God's promises, we end up fighting a physical battle instead of a spiritual one. When Jesus is arrested after the triumphal entry, Jesus is uh, arrested, and when they're in the garden at the time of the arrest, uh, the high priest comes in with guards. He's going to arrest Jesus, and Peter takes it upon himself to intervene, right? So we find this story in, in John chapter 18, starting in verse 10. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right Ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Peter could not wrap his head around how all the things that he believed that Jesus was going to be and do, how could those things come to pass if in this moment Jesus gets arrested? He had his own ideas, his own expectations of the kind of king that Jesus was going to be. And when he saw that falling apart, he took matters into his own hands. God was doing something so much bigger than Peter could possibly see or understand. See, Jesus was going into a battle not with flesh and blood, but with the spiritual rulers and authorities of this present world. Peter didn't, it, it's not that he even took like a knife to a gunfight. He went into a fight and had no idea who his opponent was. He walked into a fight with a sword looking to fight a man when Jesus was preparing to fight death itself. How have you fought a physical fight in your life when you should have been on your knees in prayer? And we are all guilty of this. But Paul reminds us in Ephesians 6, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. We know the armor of God so well that we can name off each piece of it. We can name off each one that it does. But so often, whenever I hear people talk about the armor of God, they start with the armor and they don't start with the verse before it that says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. It's his armor. We're to put him on, right? 
For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Friends, some of us need to recognize that we are in a spiritual battle not a physical one, right? Yesterday was just one of those bad days. My wife and I got into it from the word go eating breakfast together. And I was in a bad mood. She was in a bad mood. And we were just going after each other. And it took me all of like 10 seconds to recognize, man, I'm preaching tomorrow. Like this is a spiritual attack. It has nothing to do with my wife, right? I'd like to say it took me 10 seconds to like, correct my attitude, (laughs) took me a bit to enter into a spiritual battle. But that's where we need to go first. What happens when we apply our expectations to God's promises? Number three, we lose hope and we bow to our fear. We're going to look at one more story and good old Peter is going to show us once again. I love Peter. He's maybe my favorite. So after Jesus' arrest... So the arrest happens, and Jesus gets taken into the courtyard of the high priest. Peter and another disciple follow him into the high priest's courtyard, where Peter is recognized as a disciple of Jesus. Now, keep in mind, it's just earlier that night, prior to even being in the garden, that Jesus predicts that one of the disciples is going to deny even knowing him three times. And guess who boldly declares that it's not going to be him? Our hero, Peter, right? Peter stands up, surely, Lord, even if all the other ones desert you, I will never desert you. Hmm. But now after Jesus' arrest, Peter, confused, bewildered, expectations just falling apart, was losing faith. I was so, so so sure that this is what Jesus was going to do. But how's he going to do it now? You can imagine that in that confusion, as faith begins to wane, Peter loses hope. And when we lose hope, fear takes hold. So what happens? Peter gets recognized, and three times he denies even knowing Jesus. Can you imagine the the shame as he just kind of shrunk into himself? In a matter of hours, Peter had gone from someone declaring so boldly that he would never desert Jesus, he actually backs it up by being willing to fight to the death. And then in a matter of mere hours, he's someone questioning everything and denying that he even knows his rabbi and friend. And we do this, unfortunately, all the time. We, we believe that God is going to act a certain way, do a certain thing. We put our expectations on how God should move and behave. And when he doesn't do what we believed he would do, our faith shrinks, our hope wanes, and we allow fear to take over. What must we do? We must hold tightly to the promises of God, but hold loosely to our own expectations. We should hold tightly to the promises of God, to his word, to the things that he has spoken over you, to the things that he has called you to. But when we put our expectations on those things, hold loosely to those. We have to, in humility, come to the place where we acknowledge that we cannot possibly comprehend all that God is doing when he gives a promise. When he entered those city gates for the Israelites, they could not fathom that Jesus would humble himself to the point of death on a cross. 
They couldn't understand that he was taking on the sins of the world, that he was creating eternal reconciliation between us and God. They could not understand that he was going to defeat death once and for all. They could not possibly grasp that the church after this was going to explode with Pentecostal fire that the gospel would reach every corner of creation, that a time would come where every knee will bow and worship Jesus as king. They could not possibly know that we would be sitting here today as the church, that we would be proclaiming the very freedom from captivity, the very breaking of strongholds that they were believing was happening that day as Jesus walked through the gates. And we stand here today worshiping, proclaiming that very freedom. And we cannot possibly fathom what God might be up to in your life, in my life, in this generation as he continues to carry out and fulfill his promises, but what we need to know and hold tightly to is that God made his promise. He is going to fulfill it, and we can trust him. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you love us and care for us enough to hold true to your word, to fulfill the promises that you've given even when we falter all along the way. God, with Abraham and Sarah, you surrounded them and loved them and were gracious and unrelenting in your pursuit of them. God, for Peter, we see this beautiful moment of restoration in which you speak to him tenderly and lovingly and give him a mission to carry out, to shepherd and love your flock. And God, we know that we have messed up and we have trusted ourselves and our own expectations. But God, we also know that in our sin, we are met with your love and your grace. And so God, we come before you this morning. and We want to lay down our pride. We want to lay down our plans and our expectations and just humbly, God, submit to your will and trust that what you are doing is far better and far greater than anything we could come up with on our own. We love you, God. We want to say with our our hearts, our minds, and our voices that we trust you, that we bow to you as our Lord, as our Savior, as our King. We bow to you. Thank you, God. For it's in your Son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you guys stand and sing with us this morning?
much. So, so good to worship with you all. Hope you have a wonderful week. We really would love to see you at our Good Friday services across the street at 7 o'clock. Make time to be there, but we'll see you next Sunday.